is it true that sharks have to keep swimming, otherwise they'll suffocate? Well, no. Most sharks utilize buccal pumping, where they lower the floor of their oral cavity to suck in water through their mouth, close it, and raise the floor to squeeze the water out over their gills in order to extract oxygen from it. This is the same strategy used by most other fish. Now, it is true of great whites and their closest relatives, but it has nothing to do with them being sharks. It's because they're mesotherms, or partially warm-blooded. In one liter of air, there will be 226 milligrams of oxygen, while a liter of seawater will have between 5 and 8. Since they're ectotherms, or cold-blooded, most fish can meet their oxygen demands by pumping water over their gills. However, since great whites are partially warm-blooded, they have greater metabolic rates, and hence greater oxygen requirements. The only way they can meet these oxygen requirements is to keep swimming so the water is constantly flowing over their gills. This strategy is known as ram ventilation, and it's employed by other mesothermic fish which are completely unrelated to sharks such as tuna and billfish. I should note that there are some non-mesothermic sharks which employ ram ventilation, such as sandbar sharks and hammerhead sharks but these still have considerably higher metabolic rates than most other sharks. The air-water oxygen disparity can explain why so many terrestrial animals ended up returning to the water. Indeed, we see this occurring independently in many different lineages of mammals and reptiles. I mean, did you ever find it strange that air-breathing animals would evolve to live in the sea? Intuition would suggest that it would be evolutionarily disadvantageous for a marine animal to have to surface to breathe. Well, if the only way a shark could support a mesothermic metabolism is ram ventilation, the only way a marine animal could sustain a warm-blooded metabolism is to surface to breathe, taking advantage of the ample supply of oxygen in the atmosphere. Not to mention, it'll be easier to pass one liter of air over a respiratory surface than one liter of water. I saw this question. Will whales eventually evolve gills? And given what I've just said, that's highly unlikely. You could argue that even though they can't sustain themselves indefinitely, having gills would allow them to stay underwater for a few extra minutes. But to see how likely this is, we can look back to the great white shark. They've lost the ability to buccal pump, and you'd think that even though they couldn't sustain themselves indefinitely with it, buccal pumping would allow them to remain still for a short time without suffocating. However, in evolution, there are always trade-offs, and being able to perform buccal pumping requires the shark to have more moving parts in their mouth. This will add structural weaknesses that having a solid hunk of cartilage wouldn't, and when you're biting large thrashing prey species, you can see why this would be a problem. So, any extra time a great white shark could stand still thanks to a buccal pump didn't outweigh the drawbacks of said structural weaknesses. Similarly, if a whale evolved a structure which could extract oxygen from the water, it would require a great deal of vascularized tissue near the surface. That much blood flow would be a very vulnerable target for a predator or competitor. So, if great white sharks are losing pre-existing structures to pump water buccally, it's highly doubtful whales would evolve gill analogs. A good comparison would be burrowing animals losing their eyes. Sure, it might be advantageous to be able to see should they have to come above ground, but eyes are also extremely vulnerable to injury and infection, and any advantage seeing above ground provided wasn't worth this vulnerability. The disparity between oxygen in the atmosphere and ocean may also explain the rapid evolution of ichthyosaurs. Some 15 million years after the KT extinction, we see the first whales appear, and 10 million years later, they were fully aquatic. Meanwhile, ichthyosaurs appeared a mere 4 million years after the unpermian extinction. Furthermore, while the whales' transition from land to sea is well documented in the fossil record, for the longest time, the oldest known ichthyosaurs were already fully aquatic. The first amphibious species, Cordorhynchus, was described in 2011 and it lived 3 million years after the Anpermian extinction. What's even more perplexing is that while the oceans rebounded 2 million years after the KT extinction, 
It wasn't until about 20 million years after the end Permian extinction that marine systems recovered, although a recent discovery has indicated that in some areas, marine systems recovered shortly after. The answer to this conundrum may lie in the cause of the end Permian extinction, widespread ocean anoxia. Throughout the first half of the Triassic, perturbations to the carbon cycle continued to cause marine anoxia at a similar scale, and the only reason that they didn't also cause mass extinctions was because there was virtually nothing left to kill. So, being able to breathe air would give an ichthyosaur a decisive advantage. There may not have been that many prey species around, but the few that were present would have been easy to catch because they could only move slowly due to the low concentration of oxygen. But, if so much more oxygen is available in the air, why haven't fish taken advantage of it and evolved lungs alongside their gills? Indeed, multiple fish species, most notably those which inhabit bodies of water subjected to anoxia such as swamps, have vascularized swim bladders, which can extract oxygen from the air. When the oxygen supply in the water becomes depleted, fish such as the alligator gar will surface and take a gulp of air. Well, evolution is a blind watchmaker. It has no foresight. While in principle there is more oxygen available to an animal in the air, several adaptations would be required to utilize it to its fullest extent. The alligator gar uses the lining of its swim bladder to extract oxygen, while our lungs are composed of many smaller sacs known as alveoli, which increase the surface area from which oxygen can be absorbed. It's for this reason that alligator gars can't sustain themselves indefinitely off atmospheric oxygen should a pool remain anoxic. So, even though there is more oxygen in the air, the respiratory surfaces alligator gars and other air-breathing fish have can obtain more of it from the water through their gills. Because of this, should an alligator gar return to the sea, the advantage an air-breathing swim bladder would provide would be negated. But could such a fish be subjected to more evolutionary pressure to evolve an air-breathing organ by living in swamps with even less oxygen? Again, this is unlikely, since such a habitat would have the niches that fish would normally fill occupied by aquatic amphibians and reptiles who already have fully developed lungs. So, if anyone ever wanted to have gills so they could breathe underwater, hate to break it to you, but that wouldn't be enough to meet your oxygen requirements.